Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, focusing on the heart of the Silk Road, Uzbekistan. Uh, my name's Johnny Bilby. I founded Wild Frontiers, and tonight I'm delighted to be talking about what has become our most red-hot destination. Um, last year, Uzbekistan pipped India for the first time in about 20 years uh, to be the most popular destination that we offer. Um, Tonight, interestingly, uh, when we do these webinars, we have a license with Zoom to talk to uh, 500 people. Today, we had to increase that to 1,000. Such is the um, interest in this most fascinating Central Asian state. Um, so whether you're watching this live or you are watching it on catch up, you're very welcome. And I hope over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we will be able to uh, both explain uh, why this country has suddenly become so popular and uh, what it is that you can expect to see when you go there. And we hope that uh, many of you will want to go there because it is a fascinating place. So um, let me give you a little bit of uh, background on how tonight's going to run. Those of you that uh, are regulars on our webinars will kind of know the format. I give you a little bit of background on my own travels and my own history with Uzbekistan, which dates back to 1999, so 25 years. Um, we'll then, we're recording tonight's uh, uh, talk, so uh, if you um, need to watch it again or you're watching it on catch up, you will get an email tomorrow with a link to the webinar. So don't worry, if you want to nip out for a cup of tea, you'll be able to catch up on that uh, later. Um, and at the end of the talk, we will be doing a question and answer session. So hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions. I'm joined tonight by both Sophie Ibbotson and Mark, uh, our Director of Product and Operations. So that's great. So you're not just going to have me waffling on. Uh, right. But uh, having said that, let's uh, crack on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen now and uh, we can continue with the talk. So yes. Um, so again, sorry for those of you that have heard this before, but uh, it gives you a little bit of context. Um, the 90s for me were a decade of adventure. I drove a motorbike right the way around Africa, uh, which resulted in my first travel book, Running with the Moon. Uh, as a second book, I then walked through parts of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan, which was my second book for a pagan song. Uh, but perhaps more poignantly for tonight, uh, my third journey was a journey by horse along the Silk Road, following the route you can see tapping out in front of you now. So traveling up from Islamabad across the Kunjarad Pass to Kashgar, where I bought a horse and rode about two and a half thousand miles uh, across Central Asia into, um, sorry, across Central Asia uh, towards um, Turkmenistan and then across the Caspian Sea, journey of 2,500 miles, six countries and five horses. As you can see, bottom right, we left a little bit late. And by the time we were riding across the uh, deserts of Turkmenistan, blizzards came in. It was pretty uh, miserable. Uh, but that resulted in my third book, Silk Dreams Troubled Road, and in many ways, uh, Wild Frontiers, which is why we're talking to you tonight. Um, but as I say, the main thing that is pertinent to tonight was the journey that it, obviously it took me through um, a lot of those Central Asian states, particularly Uzbekistan. And what I found there was quite mesmerizing. It, it's an extraordinary country in, in many ways. Um, and I'm still kind of amazed today when I take people there and they just gape in awe at the extraordinary archaeological uh, architectural sites that the country has to offer. Of course, everyone will have heard of Samarkand, Bukhara and Kiva. They're legendary towns. They've been around for millennia. Um, they uh, are, of course, synonymous with the Silk Road, which is probably the most romantic and culturally important trade route in the history of the world. Um, but what also people, you know, don't know much about because none of us well at least i talk for myself being educated in the uk primarily um we never really hear of any of these characters that make up this place uh, that that have had such a bearing on history um tamerlane of course or emperor timor is usually just written off as this crazy despotic um madman who who, who kind of you know was known for his barbarism 
But in fact, he was an incredible military ruler uh, and and um, held an empire that was uh, as far east as Delhi and as far west as Hungary. So a huge, huge empire. Uh, Mohammed uh, Kazami, who is regarded as the founder of algebra, came from Kiva in the ninth century. And then one of my kind of favorite characters of this 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 time is um, is Ulag Bek. Now he was an amazing. Well, he was the grandson of Timur, of course. Uh, and ruled Uzbekistan in the um, uh, 15th century. Um, and he was an amazing mathematician, uh, a scholar and an astrologer. And through the observatory that he set up, which lots of us go to visit now in Samarkand, he uh, planned, uh, mapped out the planets over 10,000 stars and calculated the time of the year to within less than a minute of what we know it to be today. So he was an incredible astrologer and mathematician. And then of course, slightly more recently in the 19th century was the uh, very fascinating story of the great game. That was the kind of war of attrition played out between Tsarist Russia and British India um, for control of Central Asia. At the beginning of the 19th century, Tsarist Russia and British India were two and a half thousand miles apart. By the end of it, they were 27 miles apart, which was, of course, the Wakan Corridor. So there's all this kind of, you know, not just fascinating architecture and culture and history. It's just amazing how little we all know. And as I say, I'm always amazed when I go to Samarkand with a group or take people there or Bukhara and people just you know, are, are totally amazed by the place simply because they didn't really know it existed. This is a group I took there in the summer. So I've been traveling there, as I say, since 1999 when I did my horse journey. Um, and it was great to go back. And one of the things I, I hadn't actually been for some, I don't know, eight or nine years. And what was really nice was to see how Uzbekistan is progressing. It's actually a very um, successful state, really. Its economy is doing well. Um, along with the uh, summer, with the Silk Road architecture, you've got a lot of interesting modern architecture. Tashkent was buzzing as a place. Of course, some of that is, you know, on the slightly kitsch side, but I actually really enjoyed this. This is uh, the Registan on a Friday evening. All the locals come down and enjoy this kind of a light show that they put on across the um, across all the beautiful architecture. Um, so that's my kind of brief little story of Uzbekistan, who I'm going to hand you over to now knows a whole lot more about it than I do. Sophie Ibbotson is a writer and consultant specializing in Central Asia, where she has worked since 2008. She is Uzbekistan's ambassador for tourism, uh, an advisor for the World Bank and governments of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and is chairman of the Royal Society for Asiatic Affairs. Sophie has written six guidebooks for Brat Travel Guides, and is currently writing a book on the Oxus River. She is a regular contributor to publications including Lonely Planet, The Telegraph, Wanderlust, and City AM. So Sophie, if you're there, I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you. Thank you, Sophie. Good evening, Johnny, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk to everybody this evening. It's also really nice to be chatting with somebody who's been knocking around Central Asia even longer than I have. I first went to Central Asia in 2008, which makes me feel sometimes like, a, like an old hand. But in those 15 years, I've had the great pleasure not only to travel the breadth and depth of, of Central Asia and the Silk Road, but also to see how the countries are changing, because it feels that Uzbekistan in particular is much, much more dynamic than it was a decade ago. You mentioned the contemporary architecture and the buzz in Tashkent, but even in the smaller cities, things like the high-speed train, um, new construction, and a new generation of very international looking young people are all driving the country forward. So it's a very, very exciting time to be in Uzbekistan, and I'm very priv privileged to be able to go there four, five, even six times a year now. So ooh, I'm just going to try and share my screen with you so that you'll have my, my pictures as well, which hopefully you can, you can now see. My talk this evening is going to be divided really into three parts. So the first part will be an introduction to the Silk Road, what it is, where it went. The second will be focused 
particularly on Uzbekistan and the ancient and the medieval world, because it's the history of Uzbekistan which draws so many people to the country in the first place. And then in the last part of my talk, before we move on to Q&A, I'm going to be talking about contemporary Uzbekistan, because that's where the surprises lie and I think is just as fascinating as the past. So we use the word the Silk Road very, very often. Um, in fact, I'm going to swap straight on to, to this slide because it shows it a bit more clearly. We often talk about the Silk Road in the singular, but as Peter Frankenpan showed in his book, Silk Roads, which I'm sure many of you will have read, there wasn't just one road. It wasn't a, a linear route from Europe to China and back again, but it's much better to think about it as a, a web or a network of trading routes. And those routes are going east to west, but they're also going north to south. So they're stretching up into the southern parts of Russia and then going well down into the Indian subcontinent. And if you look at this map here, you can see that Uzbekistan is right in the heart of the action. And that's going to be hugely important for the development of the country, economically and culturally over the centuries. Now, we might think that the Silk Road is something very ancient, and indeed these trade routes existed two, 3,000 years ago. But the term, the Silk Road, is pretty recent. In fact, it wasn't until 1877 that the geographer and traveller Baron Ferdinand von Richthofen wrote about the Seidenstrasse in his book. So Seidenstrasse, of course, is, is the German for uh, Silk Road, and it's a name which has stuck to describe the trading routes. Silk wasn't the only product that was being traded along them, but it's something which epitomized the, the romance and the glamour of this in our collective imagination. The Silk Roads themselves date back primarily to 130 BC, which is when the Han Dynasty in China really opened up to trade with the West. The reality was that there was already localized trade in many of these areas, but there wasn't the, the network. So you might have traded with people a few hundred miles away, but there then wasn't a, an established network of, of markets and infrastructure to get your goods the very, very long distances. Now, the, the web of the Silk Roads spread far and wide, but where it went was dictated very much by physical geography. It's not, and if we look back at those routes, it's not that people followed the straight line. In fact, if you look at a route from, for example, uh, Turfan in the east through to Balkash, we can see actually it's taken quite a loop rather than the straight route. And the reason for this is the terrain that it has to pass through. We've got huge mountains and passes. We've got some of the great mountain ranges in the world. There's the Himalayas, there's the Pamir, there's the Karakoram, there's the Altai. These are mountains which are up to 8,000 meters tall. Um, in winter, there's no way that you can get through those ranges because of the, the cold and the snow and the ice. But even in summer, they're a pretty inhospitable territory. You're going to be limited to where the passes are, um, and particularly the lower passes, and also your ability to follow the river valleys. In the introduction, Johnny mentioned my interest in the Oxus, um, which is what the Greeks called the river today known as the Amodaria. It's the great river of Central Asia. But there are also rivers like the Sirdaria and all of its tributaries. And if you followed a river, not only was that a, a natural pass through the mountains, but it also would ensure that you always had something to drink. There were settlements along the way, um, and we see the settlements in the deserts as well. So a bit like with the mountains, the desert is a physical barrier. You might think, oh, well, it's flat, I can go straight. But no, here your limiting factor is water, as well as to some extent, the heat. The camel became a very important piece of, of desert infrastructure because that's how you can transit the, the long, long distances. But much more important is the location of the oases. So where you can find drinking water in these very, very arid climates. And this is where Uzbekistan's cities come into play. We wouldn't have cities without the oases. The oases became hubs for settlement, for trade, and then grew and grew into great regional centers. I think one of the most interesting ones in this case is Kiva, which is in the western part of Uzbekistan, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In fact, for many people, it's their favourite city when they visit Uzbekistan. Kiva began life not as a trading place, but as a sacred place. Its origin legend is that Shem, who was the son of the biblical Noah, 
he of the uh, the great flood and the ark fame was traveling through the desert and he found um a spring a natural spring he dug a well and from that he had the the water supply the well that he supposedly dug still exists in the city and it is said that the reason that the city was built in the shape of a boat the shape of a ship is because of the inspiration from from Noah Job's father uh, sorry um Shem's father I, I was a slip of the tongue saying Job because actually Job uh, who is another prophet in in the Old Testament is is associated with Bukhara there we have a, a shrine called the Ayub Chashma Ayub being the the local name for Job and Chashma being spring because the spring there is said to have been created by miracle by Job so the routes through the Silk Road either are going through the mountain passes and along the river valleys, or in the drier areas, they're connecting the oases. And this is what dictates the routes that the caravans can pass. This is one of the, the trading domes in Bukhara, which is a, a particular favourite of mine. So archaeologists believe that the cities or settlements in uh, Central Asia were first inhabited, first occupied from about 40,000 years ago, but they wouldn't have been recognized as urban centers before the early Iron Age. So we're talking about the seventh to the fifth century BC. So the people who had been hunter gatherers were able to settle, um, develop agriculture. And then as they had an agricultural surplus, that is the point at which they began to trade with one another, to set up marketplaces, to set up towns. I seem to have I seem to have lost a, a picture here. Um, so the where the marketplaces grew, there was there was competition for trade. And initially you would find that the, the marketplaces would grow up around the crossroads because that is where you're going to get the most business. But then you find that wealthy, wealthy landowners, wealthy rulers want to capitalize on that trade and make the most of it. And what they do is they start building indoor marketplaces as well as outdoor marketplaces. So that is going to protect your traders, uh, your customers and your goods from the elements. But it's also going to be an advertising tool. It's a way to attract people to, to a particular area. And what we have in Bukhara, which survived to the present day, are the trading domes like this one in the picture. And there was a different dome for each of the goods being traded. So if, for example, you were a silk merchant, you would go and you'd be trading your goods in the textiles dome. If you were trading uh, spices, you'd go to another one. Uh, Bukhara also has one for the hat makers. So you would be going and trading your goods in a, a specialized area. And it meant that as a customer, um, and we're talking predominantly wholesale customers here rather than retail, uh, you wouldn't have to be traipsing all over the city's markets to find potential people to do business with. You would go to a very specific trading dome, everything that you needed, everyone you wanted to meet would be in the same place and you can get the best products at the best price. The challenge that we have, and this is stretching from the commercial and economic history of Central Asia now into the political history, is that whenever you have this sort of infrastructure, whenever you've got the, the wealth generation of the markets, somebody is going to want to slice that pie. Wealth is always very, very attractive. The great empires of the ancient and medieval world grew up in part to possess, to control the market towns and thus the wealth that was traded between them. Um, some of the, the greatest empires in, in the ancient world centered on the Silk Road. So we have not only Alexander the Great, but we also have Genghis Khan, we have Amir Timur, Babur, and so on and so forth. The one of these figures which is most associated with Uzbekistan, however, is Amir Timur, who we know in the West as Tamerlane. And that's an insult. Uh, it's what the Westerners called him because it is a corruption of Timur the Lame. It is said that this great mighty empire walks with a limp and therefore his, his critics, his adversaries, use that against him. And uh, yes, unfortunately, Tamerlane has stuck as a name, but his, his official title is Amir Timur, the, the Emperor Timur. So Timur uh, lived in Central Asia in the late 14th century. In fact, he died in, in 1405. 
And as well as being a very successful military man and widening the empire over a huge, huge territory, he was also a patron of the arts. And he was able to bring artists and architects and engineers from all over his empire to build his new capital in Samarkand. So this is the birthplace of Timur in Uzbekistan in Shakhrisabz, and it's a place, it's also a UNESCO site, which many of you will visit. It means the green city. This was his homeland. Um, he claimed descent from Genghis Khan, and from birth, really, he believed that he was destined for greatness. But his birthplace was only a relatively simple uh, city. He did ensure that there were a number of monuments built there, but because of its location over a high mountain pass that was cut off in winter, it was never going to be a great world capital. He had to find a different location for that. But luckily for Timur, a short distance away over that pass was Samarkand, which even in the 14th century was already a major trading center. In fact, if we go back a thousand years prior to that, when Alexander the Great was invading Central Asia, he described Samarkand, or Marikanda as it was then, as one of the most beautiful places he'd ever seen. It really took his breath away. So Timur had a huge amount to, to work with. It was already uh, commercially very successful. There were already some interesting buildings, but he wanted to make it better. And he also wanted to represent him and his power and his cosmopolitanism. I mentioned about the, the artisans and the architects he brought here, but we have to remember also that it was built and expanded with the wealth from his campaigns, with the slave labor from his campaigns, and also, and I always think this is a quite a, an interesting one, with the elephants from his campaigns, because Timur was very successful in his battles in India, where he would no doubt have encountered large numbers of elephants. He witnessed their power, their strength, and he brought them back to Samarkand. He didn't have access to cranes and heavy plant, but he could use the elephants in the constructions of his mighty buildings. So the Bibi Kanu Mosque, for example, was built with elephant power. The wealth of, of the Timurids, and to some extent, the um, dynasties either side of them, was often put to religious use as well. There were shrines all across Central Asia, and particularly in Uzbekistan, linked to different holy men. So I've mentioned already the shrine in Bukhara, which is linked to Job and the, the connection with Shem in Kiva. But for the Muslim pilgrims who come to Central Asia, and indeed for those with more general interest in history, one of the most sacred sites in Uzbekistan, indeed the entire Islamic world, is this. And this is the shrine of Imam al-Bukhari, who is the collector of the Hadiths. Now, any of you who know a little bit about Islamic theology will know there are two sources of uh, religious authority in Islam. The first is the Quran, which is the word of God, as told to Muhammad and written down. The second source, however, is the Hadiths. And these are the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And Imam Bukhari traveled around um, in the decades after the Prophet's death, collecting these sayings from different people. And he put them together into a collection and his collection is considered to be the most authoritative collection of, of these sayings. And so people will come even today from all over the world to see uh, where Bukhari was born, just outside uh, Bukhara, and where he died near to Samarkand at the age of 60. The complex which is there built around his grave is a relatively modern one and it's being rebuilt at the moment because after the fall of the Soviet Union, the revival of Islam in Central Asia and indeed Uzbekistan opening up to the world, there is so much more interest in uh, al-Bukhari and the Islamic cultural heritage of the country that they simply can't keep up with all of the visitors. So they're expanding the complex with a new mosque, uh, with a library, with exhibition facilities and so on and so forth to accommodate the, the influx of visitors that they have. The, the theology and the scholarship of Central Asia are very much entwined. In Johnny's introduction, he showed us both Ulugbeg and al Khwarezmi, the, the father of uh, algebra and uh, algorithms. I think it's fair to say, and in fact, I'm talking to you from Oxford this evening, that the religious centers in Uzbekistan were very much like the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge in the medieval period. All of them started as religious communities, which grew into universities. 
partly that's because it would have been the um, clerical, the, the sort of the clergy uh, of any religion who were most likely to be the literate population, but also they had the, the facilities and the time to pursue intellectual endeavors. The madrasas, which are the, the religious schools, which were built in, in Kiva and in Samarkand and Bukhara, are very much like the Oxbridge colleges because they were communities for teaching, for research, and where scholars would live together. They had a very broad curriculum, not only in Quranic studies, but also in foreign languages, in mathematics, in philosophy, astronomy, languages, literature, and so on and so forth. And they had superb libraries, um, which is why uh, the madrasas, particularly in Baghdad, sorry, in Bukhara, were recognized as probably the most important in the Islamic world alongside those of Baghdad and Damascus. The picture that I have here for you is the Mir-e-Arab Madrasa in Bukhara. And it's one of the largest, but it's also one of the most important because it is the only madrasa which was allowed to continue operating throughout the Soviet period, so throughout the 20th century. Almost all religious institutions, not only in Central Asia, but in the wider Soviet Union were, were closed by the communists. Um, uh, but this one, for a variety of reasons, was allowed to continue operating, and it still has students today. It's it's a place of, of research and of, of study. So most buildings of this kind in Uzbekistan are now considered to be historic monuments and are open to, to the public, including visiting tourists. But this particular madrasa is still a working place of study, and so you can view it from the outside, but you can't go indoors. The three most famous madrasas in Uzbekistan, however, are, are these three, and they are the three buildings spread around the Registan Square in Samarkand, the one where Johnny showed us the picture with the beautiful light show early on. I often say to people that the Samarkand, sorry, the, the Registan is to Uzbekistan as the Taj Mahal is to India or the Eiffel Tower is to Paris. It is the one site which captures people's imagination and really encapsulates the essence of the tourism products. And really not only in Uzbekistan, but for the entirety of the Silk Road, this site is the heart of the Silk Road. The three madrasas here, uh, one on each side and one at the back, date from the 15th to the 17th century. And the first of them, the one on the left is the Ulugbeg Madrasa. Now Ulugbeg is the astronomer king who Johnny mentioned earlier. He had his madrasa here. The facade is decorated with stars as a nod to his love of astronomy. And his observatory was a short distance away um, in another part of the city. The star catalogue which Ulugbeg produced in this madrasa with his, his fellow astronomers and at his observatory mapped 1,018 stars. And it is considered to be the greatest astronomical work between those of Ptolemy and of Tycho Brahe. It was still being studied in Oxford in the, the 17th and 18th century. And some of the calculations that he did, and of course we're talking about a, an area of manual calculations, weren't uh, improved upon in their accuracy until the invention of the computer. So it was incredibly sophisticated knowledge that they had here. And that knowledge was able to transmit along the Silk Road um, to, to Europe and to China and to further knowledge there. I'm going to move on now because I'm aware of time and talk to you a little bit about contemporary Uzbekistan, because although it is the archaeology and the historical sites that draw people there in the first place, what really takes their breath away is actually how modern Uzbekistan is in many ways. And the country is driving forward, but it has managed to retain its heritage and develop alongside it. It's, it's not an either or, it's, it's got both components. And this is epitomized by the high-speed train network, which links Tashkent to Samarkand and Bukhara, but also is being extended to Kiva and to Nukas in the West. Um, I also see it in the mix of historic, of Soviets and of post-independence architecture, really some imaginative buildings being, being put up. Um, both uh, public buildings, but also uh, residential buildings, research facilities. One 
absolutely fascinating site that you, you might like to visit if you go to Tashkent region is just outside the capital at Parkent is what's called the Solar Furnace. And it was built by the Academy of Science for um, experiments that require extreme heat. Uh, there are only two of these facilities in the world. The other one is in, in France. So it is not that Uzbekistan has lost its interest in, in science in the medieval period. Arguably, there's, there's a continuity into science and research. Um, I also see the dynamism in the number of international events which are taking place in Uzbekistan today. A few years ago, it felt that Uzbekistan was quite cut off, but now that has really changed. Uh, the the connectivity has improved. People can get to Uzbekistan very easily, but the government is taking the lead in international events. So, um, in in the autumn, they hosted the uh, UNWTO, so the UN's Tourism Organization's General Assembly, in Samarkand. Uh, there have also been COP events uh, to do with with climate change. Uh, another COP event, the uh, Convention for Migratory Species, is taking place in Uzbekistan next month. So they're taking a, a leading role, not only lead, regionally, but internationally. And a lot of experts are coming to Uzbekistan. It's regaining its role as, as a center of, of knowledge exchange uh, and, and creativity as well. In addition to the, the physical aspects of, of infrastructure and, and monuments, you need to be able to immerse yourself in the intangible cultural heritage of Uzbekistan, because that is something which has got continuity from the past, but is also continually evolving and developing. One of the easiest ways to experience this is to participate in one of the festivals in Uzbekistan. So I know Wild Frontiers has got a tour going in the latter part of March, which coincides with Navruz, the Persian and Turkish, uh, Turkic New Year on 21st of March. That is the um, equinox. So when the uh, day and night are of equal distance, uh, sorry, equal length. And that is a, a festival in Central Asia, which predates the arrival of Islam. In fact, it dates back to when this was a predominantly Zoroastrian community and the uh, the natural elements and the, the sun and the moon had much greater importance. But that festival is, is retained um, and is a very good opportunity to learn about some of the community-focused events in Uzbekistan. If you're travelling at other times of the year, uh, you might like to go to the Silk and Spices Festival, which takes place in Bukhara. There's the Lazgi Festival of Dance in Kiva, which is where a good opportunity to see traditional dance. And there's the Shark Teran Lari in Samarkand, which takes place in the Registan, and that's a festival of music. One of the things that I, I went to um, about uh, 18 months ago was, was quite a, a surprising festival, and that is the Stihia uh, Electronic Music Festival, which takes place in, in the Aral Sea region in, in Moynak. And I, I took my father People are usually quite surprised that Uzbekistan has a strong electronic music scene. I would say not only does it have the strongest electronic music scene in Central Asia, but a growing reputation internationally as well. So there are DJs and electronic artists who come there from uh, Europe, from Russia uh, and, and further afield to, to perform in Stahir. So if electronic music is your thing, look up for, for Stahir this, this year. It is, it is happening in the summer. Um, Another way to experience the intangible cultural heritage of Uzbekistan is through the country's community-based tourism, which is developing now very, very fast. And I'm really glad to see this because it's a way of spreading the benefits of tourism beyond the cities. And it's a way for tourists to be able to meet and get to know local people and their, their everyday lives. Um, one of the fascinating things about traveling is not just the big statement sites, but also seeing how people live, what people think, um, sharing opinions, sharing experiences. And community-based tourism enables you to do that, but it also creates jobs and opportunities for, for local people. So it's a win-win. There are lots of places now where you can go and stay in a village guest house, uh, or perhaps stay with somebody in their home. And even if you don't want to stay the night, perhaps you'll go for a meal in somebody's home. And that's a great way of having home cooked food, lively conversation, 
Uh, and you know, if you're a nosy person like me, being able to go and poke around somebody else's house as well, see their garden, meet their children, see their pets, and really get a, an insight into uh, domestic life in Uzbekistan. One thing that people often enjoy as well is, is not only going into the villages, but going to the yurt camps. Yurts are more traditionally associated with, with Kazakhstan and with Kyrgyzstan because they had a bigger nomadic population. Uzbekistan's population, more people were settled because of the big uh, cities which grew up along the Silk Road. But there was a nomadic population here too. Um, the, the Kyrgyz and the, the Kazakhs and the Karakalpaks, who uh, have the Autonomous Republic in the western part of Uzbekistan, all um, moved within these territories too. And in fact, many of them still live within the borders of what is now Uzbekistan. There are very few people who are nomadic in, in Uzbekistan today, but they do, even if people have settled, they do retain some of their nomadic traditions. And one of those is, is the yurt. Now, these yurts may not look terribly beautiful from the outside, but they're richly decorated inside. They're very, very warm, they're very, very comfortable. And it's great fun to spend a night or two out in the desert, staying in a yurt camp, and a real contrast to the cities and, and the, sort of the, the bigger hotels. What I like about the yurt camp is the desert environment, of course, the, the peace of being in the desert, but also that when it comes to the evening time, there's usually a campfire, there's usually storytelling, there's usually music, uh, often local singer or a instrumentalist will come. And you do feel once the darkness falls that you could be sat in the same place, having the same conversations, eating the same food and enjoying the same music that a Silk Road traveller would have had 500 or even a thousand years ago. And that sense of timelessness is quite magical. What you were also able to then experience is the darkness of night sky. Central Asia, because it is relatively sparsely populated, has quite low levels of light pollution, particularly compared to, to Western Europe and the UK, where we're very built up with, with too many lights. And so once you are ready for bed, do take time to look up at the night sky. You'll probably see the whole creamy cloud of the Milky Way. You can often see the International Space Station going over. You can see shooting stars. And it's quite magical, um, really a highlight of, of any any trip. I think I am going to um, stop wittering at you now and uh, <laughs> hand over back to, to Mark and Johnny and I will pick up again when we have got some questions. Sophie, thank you so much. That's, um, as always, incredibly informative and eloquent and, and really, um, wow, so many things to, to get your teeth into there, including electronic music festivals, which I hadn't realized. Um, should that be your bag? There you go. Now, before we move on, so thank you so much, Sophie. Absolutely brilliant. Before we move on to Mark, I'm just going to throw up a quick poll. So uh, fingers on your buzzers, everyone. I just want to ask a quick question. So uh, how many, sorry, how many of Central Asia's five stars have you visited? So fire away on one, two, three, four, or all five. Um, and uh, I will um, share the results when we've done that. So let's just uh, crack on there. Am I doing this right? Am I? Oh yeah, there we go. Good, good, good. Here we go. Good. There is a lot of people out there, so it'll be interesting to see. I'm actually quite pleased to see zero is leading the way. <laughs> all five. We've got four, five, six people that have been to all five. That's fantastic. Um, right, I'll give you another five seconds and then we will close the poll. All right, looks like just about everybody's done it. Okay, share results. Uh, so there we go. 72% um, have not been to Central Asia before. That's fabulous. 31, 13% uh, 30, have been to one. 6% to 2%, 4% to 3%, 3% to 2%, and 1% to all 5 Great. Okay, so we are talking to people that I hope will enjoy uh, going there. Mark, I'm going to hand over to you and, um, yeah, over, uh, to talk to us about the various trips that are on offer. Fine. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Johnny, Sophie, thank you very, very much. 
Um, so, yeah, if that has inspired you in any way to go to Uzbekistan and Central Asia, I am here just to give you a few ideas as to how you can travel there. Now, for those of you that don't know um, too much about Wild Frontiers, we offer both small group tours with a maximum group size of 12, as well as a full tailor-made um, offering to Central Asia as well, depending. So you can tweak, you can change, you can travel by yourself, in a couple, with family or with friends. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some of our group tour itineraries just to talk you through some of the ideas um, so you can see what may appeal um, to you. But please bear in mind that all of these can be done on a tailor-made basis or changed. So I am going to start off with our undeniably our most popular trip to Central Asia, which is our Land of Silk Road Treasures 11 day tour. And this includes a lot of the places that Johnny and Sophie have been talking about. You've got Tashkent, you've got Kiva, you've got Bukhara, you've got Samarkand. But in addition, you've also got forays into the Kizilkum Desert and also into the Narata Mountains. So it's a really nice, um, varied, balanced trip. And I'm going to talk you through this routing just so you can see what it involves. Now, almost all trips arrive into the capital Tashkent in the early hours of the morning. So you almost certainly arrive and go straight to bed, leaving you hopefully nice refreshed the next day for a full day to explore the capital Tashkent and here we normally go to the um, cast imam complex which you can see here in the top left which has got buildings dating back to the 16th century you can explore the metro system which was modeled on its more famous um, counterpart in Moscow um, you go to the Chorsu Bazaar where you can see incredible produce um, on offer including the, the wonderful bread that Uzbekistan's quite famous for and then some of the really interesting Soviet era buildings um, like the Alicia Nevoy um, Ballet and Opera Theatre that you can see here. So a full day to enjoy Tashkent before the next morning taking a flight up into the west of the country um, to go and explore the Kizilkum Desert. And here you'll see some of the places that Sophie was talking about. We go to Ayaz Color, we go to Toprak Color. These are old fortresses which date back over 2000 years. And from there we go to Kiva, the first of the, of the main cities. Um, and here it is an absolute delight to wander around. You can explore the, the walls, which you can walk around, which are incredibly well preserved. You've got the, um, the Friday Mosque, the Jama Masjid, with its 212 wooden pillars. And you've got really the streets of the Ichankala, the old city, um, really to explore. Now, from there, you've then got a long journey to Bukhara. You do have to cross the Amudaria, the Oxus River, that Sophie's writing a book on. Um, and sometimes we drive this, but it depends on the train schedules. If we can, we will take a train. But pretty much either way, you're looking at a full day's journey through the desert to get you down to Bukhara. Now, one of the key sites in Bukhara um, is the Ark, which sits right at the center. And it was outside the Ark that in 1842, Stoddart and Connolly, two British officers, were beheaded by the Emir of Bukhara, Nasrullah Khan. That story is the opening page of Peter Hopkirk's Great Game. And if you've got any interest whatsoever, I would say in Central Asia, and if you haven't read it, I can thoroughly recommend The Great Game. It is a stunning story. It's a stunning book, um, and it will give you a really good understanding of um, Uzbekistan and the entire history. And Bukhara is much more lively, I would say, than Kiva. Kiva is more of a museum city. Bukhara is very much alive. It's a living city. You've got some famous sites like the Charminar. You've got the Liabi House Oasis right in the center. And you've got some beautiful architectural delights all around. It's also a center for, for, for crafts. You've got rugs. You've got pottery. And we usually try and show people here a plov making demonstration and plov is connected with the word pilau and it's a rice and meat dish and this is the national dish in Uzbekistan 
and it is wonderful. Um, from there, we take a break from the cities. And like Sophie was talking about some of the community based tourism projects, we go out into the Narata Mountains to spend one night in a village, um, really experience a little bit of village life, go for a walk, listen to some music, have some home cooked food. And it's a really, really nice experience. And it provides a, a nice contrast to the cities. But then you are back to Samarkand, which for me is probably my favourite. Um, and going to the Registan, it really is something that you want to do more than once because at different times of the day, the lighting, the whole atmosphere changes and it really doesn't disappoint. It's fantastic. But Samarkand is so much more than just the Registan. You've got the Gur um, uh, Mausoleum, which is the resting place of Tamerlan. You've got the Shah i Zinda, which was the whole almost funerary street where generation after generation of people were built. There are so many sites to see in this city. Um, you will not get bored at all. And again, like Bukhara, it's very much a, a living, vibrant city. There's music. You'll often see weddings going on. There's um, old paper factories that have been resurrected and you can even do wine tasting in Uzbekistan. Um, hasn't yet got an international reputation but watch this space it may well come. Um, and actually I have to say inspired by Sophie when we did a similar talk at the Uzbek embassy last year and she was talking about Navruz and the Persian New Year we have as Sophie said got this festival departure going on in March. We're going to see Navruz um, in Kiva which I think is going to be one Wonderful. And we've also scheduled it for next year, where we'll be seeing it in Bukhara as well. And it's just meant to be a wonderful time uh, to be in Uzbekistan with music and dancing and celebrations going on. I'm also very excited to say that this year we've also scheduled a trip to coincide with the World Nomad Games. Now, these only happen every two years. Um, the first couple were in Kyrgyzstan. Then two years ago, they were in Turkey. And this year, they are not in Uzbekistan, but they are in neighbouring Kazakhstan. So we are going to offer this trip to Uzbekistan, which will then travel up to Kazakhstan to go and see the World Nomad Games, where you've got horse riding, you've got archery, you've got wrestling. Um, and it's really just this incredible celebration of nomadic life of Central Asia. And this is a new thing for us. We're finding more and more people wanting to go to Uzbekistan out of season in the winter. Um, and this really is from about mid-November through to end of March, beginning of April. Why? One, there are far fewer people visiting at this time. And also it is a cheaper time to visit. So it just provides a contrasting way for those of you that can and don't mind the cold. And it is cold in winter, no two ways about it. But it does provide you with an alternative way to see the country um, if that's what you're looking for. As for us, as Sophie said, you've got these high speed trains which are being developed throughout the country. So we use one of the high speed trains to get from Samarkand back to Tashkent. We also use a domestic flight with Uzbekistan Airways. And for most of the time, we are traveling around by coaster bus. As to where we stay, there is a little bit from trip to trip, but generally in the capital, Tashkent, you've got a wide variety of places. On the group tour, we usually stay in the four star city palace. Um, in Kiva, you've got some more characterful accommodation. So we often stay at the Orient Star, which is a converted madrasa. Um, Bukhara is undoubtedly the place where you've got the greatest variety of characterful accommodation. And our favourite place to stay here is this Jewish merchant's house, which has been converted into a really, really lovely boutique hotel. It's called Sasha and Sons, and that's where we usually try and stay. Then for the one night up in the Narata Mountains, it is simpler, but it's very comfy. It's very cosy. There are shared facilities, but it gives a really good insight into village life as well. And I've been reliably told that there is good Wi-Fi there now these days as well. Some can as well, as you'd imagine, some very comfortable, lovely accommodation. As to how you get to Uzbekistan, well, it's becoming easier and easier. If you're coming from the UK, then Uzbekistan now airways now fly direct three day times a week, up from twice a week. And I also check they've got routings in from the States and many other destinations as well. But regardless, you can always get there into many centres via Turkish Airlines any day of the week. 
And with regards to visas, if any of you have traveled in years gone past and may have horror stories of queuing at embassies or submitting passports for weeks upon end, none of that. Uzbekistan is visa free for almost all nationalities. It is very, very easy. And when you're there, for anyone that's done any types of travel, you'll know how important guides and leaders are. And I'm very proud that one of our top leaders out in Uzbekistan, Nilufar, she came in the top 10 for the Wonderlust World Guide Awards last year. Um, it was a really big thing for us. It was a big thing, obviously, for her. But I also think it was a big thing for Uzbekistan as well to have one of their um, you know, guides up there in the awards. Um, and obviously, Nilafar leads a lot of our trips, but not all of them. But we've got many, many guides that we've trained up. Um, and in fact, Nilafar was trained up in one of these sessions back in 2019. And for those of you with very beady eyes, you may notice a, a, a rather grey haired gentleman in the middle of the picture on the top left. That is one of our top tour leaders, Mark Stedman, who actually won the Wonderlust Guide Award back in 2015. And Mark is going back out to um, Uzbekistan this weekend to do another training session um, of guides and leaders ready for the year ahead. So one way of traveling is on one of our group tours with um, 12 clients maximum. But as I said, we do offer a full range of tailor-made options and that you'll be speaking either to Katie or to Natalie predominantly in our team. And obviously they can arrange anything that you've seen. But in addition, there are options to go out to the Aral Sea and see some of the boat um, kind of graveyards that it's famous for. You can go to Shakhri Subs, the birthplace. You can go and see Suzani embroidery. And you can actually do some trekking in some of the mountains of the Western Tian Shan as well. So lots of different options that you can do there as well. Now, Uzbekistan is a brilliant place to go and visit by itself. And as you said, as I've said, many people do. But if you've got greater interest or if you've got more time or if you want to answer that poll in the future as more than just having been to one stan, uh, we offer quite a few trips that offer Uzbekistan in combination with one of the or two or three or even all of the stands. As you can see, it borders all of them here. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of some of those options. This undoubtedly is one of our most popular, combining Uzbekistan with Kyrgyzstan. Why do they make such a good pairing? Partly because they are polar opposite. This is Kyrgyzstan. It's mountainous. It's high altitude. It's semi-nomadic. It does have some cultural sites. You've got the 11th century Burana Tower. You've got the 15th century um, Tashrabat. But realistically, that's not why you're going to Kyrgyzstan. You're going for the mountains. You're going for the high altitude lakes like Songkul, where you can go horse riding, see petroglyphs, go for a walk. You've got the beautiful Tian Shan Mountains where you can just spend endless days exploring, meeting the semi-nomadic people, seeing eagle hunters and staying in yurts in a country where yurts are still very, very much used. So Kyrgyzstan provides a really nice balancing act, I would say, to Uzbekistan. And when you take this route, you actually enter Uzbekistan from its eastern edge and you travel through the Fagana Valley. Now, the Fagana Valley is the breadbasket of Uzbekistan, to some extent, the breadbasket of the entire Central Asia region. And this enables you to go through places like Kokand, where you can see the Khan's palace. And Kokand was one of the most powerful emirates um, of Central Asia up until the 19th century. Um, you also get the opportunity on this to go through Margilan, where you can get to see a silk factory, where you'll see the entire process from cocoon to finished product, as I will show you very briefly in this little video.
And obviously there's something quite special about seeing silk being made on the Silk Road. Anyway, that's Kyrgyzstan. Another combination trip that's very popular is to combine Uzbekistan with its southern neighbour, Turkmenistan. So Turkmenistan is not mountainous at all. It's nothing like Kyrgyzstan. Turkmenistan is undoubtedly the oddest country of all the stars, partly because of this gentleman. This gentleman is Niazov. He became president of Turkmenistan back in 1991 when it gained independence from the Soviet Union. And a few years later, he declared himself president for life, which was true until he died in 2006. And during his time, he engendered a whole personality cult around himself. He banned anything which he considered to be un-Turkmen, which included beards, it included long hair, it included theatre, ballet. And he named days of the week months, cities, canals, breeds of horses, and even a crater of the moon after himself and members of his family. And even though Turkmenistan has moved on since his death, um, it is still very much, you feel his legacy, and there is an oddness um, which surrounds you whenever you travel Turkmenistan. One of the archaeological sites um, that people go to uh, Turkmenistan for is Merv. Now, if you remember back to Sophie's map of all the Silk Roads, you may remember seeing Merv. Merv in its heyday, which was about the 10th and 11th century, saw Merv being considered to be the second most important city in the entire world after Baghdad, to the extent that when Genghis Khan came through, it said that he put a million people in Merv to the sword. So you've got these epic ruins of Merv that you can go and explore with almost no one else around. You've also got very bizarre sites like the Devaza gas crater, which you often see on 100 bizarre sites to see around the world. And if you like your sites a little bit rougher and less renovated, then you've got places like Konya Ogench, um, which are similar to what you're seeing in Uzbekistan, but with a fraction of the visitors and in a very different state. And you get a chance to experience the bizarre capital of Ashgabat, which I always describe as a bit of a cross between Pyongyang and Vegas. Um, it holds the Guinness Book of British Records for having more white marble on earth than any other city. And you have these incredible statues around, including one of Niazov, that starts off in the morning facing east, and then it rotates with the sun as it moves around. So some very bizarre sites, as well as it's home to the world's largest carpet. So that's Turkmenistan. And on this trip, you actually get to enter Uzbekistan via a border over in the northwest of the country. And this allows you to visit Nukus, where you've got the Savitsky Museum, which for some people is one of their highlights to the whole of Uzbekistan. You find this incredible um, Russian avant-garde museum in the most unlikely of places. So that is the um, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And then finally, for the two combo trips, if you want a shorter trip or if you have less time, uh, but you still want to experience mountains, you can combine with the nearby Fan Mountains, which are absolutely beautiful. You can see a skin Lake. You can still see um, the Sogdian remains of Penjikent. You can do some community-based tourism projects as well. Finally, if you've got more time and you really want to see more of the countries in the region, you can combine four countries on the Silk Road Odyssey, which is 23 days, combining Kyrgyzstan with Kashgar in China to Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. If you want to do all five stands, you can. 29 days, all five countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and of course, Oda Turkmenistan. And then finally, um, if you have 48 days at your disposal and you want to see the lot, we have a trip that starts in Xi'an and goes right the way over to Istanbul, taking you through China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Turkey finishing in Istanbul. Back to you, Johnny. Mark, thank you very much. Goodness me, I, I'm very aware of the time. You did a good job there um, getting us through all those potential options. Um, for our viewers, 
tonight, if you feel slightly confused by that, then just take a bit of time to have a look at the website. They're all very clearly illustrated. Um, as Mark said, the, the most popular trip to Uzbekistan is the Land of Silk Road Treasures, um, which is um, uh, 11 days. And that, that's the kind of the kind of key trip, if you like, for Uzbekistan. But if you've got more time, as Mark said, and you want to share it, uh, the country with other places then there are a lot of options out there right without me prattling on anymore um mike is joining us now um mike uh i think you have a few questions for us oh you you're muted i think i'm muted yes um first question is from andrew who's just wondering how easy it is to travel in in this part of the world both logistically and in terms of safety well it's a very easy answer to that if you travel with wild frontiers it's very easy <laughs> um, it, so. it is. Yeah, Sophie will have a, a different take on this. Uh, I'm sure it, it's it's not the easiest part of the world to travel independently, and of course I probably would say that. But but it's not the 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 kind of public transport between places is not that easy. Of course, the language is problematic. Um, so it's it's not the easiest part of the world to travel independently. Sophie, would you concur? I, I would. I would say it depends where you're going. If you just want to go to Tashkent, Samarkand, Bukhara, you can take the high speed train. That's not a problem. The issue is if you want to go beyond those major sites and then you are going to need, unless you have good language skills, a lot of time and a lot of patience, you need to go with a tour operator to get the most out of it and to reach those harder to reach points. Yeah. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Chris has asked what, what Uzbekistan is like in terms of travelling for women. Uzbekistan is incredibly safe for women, and this is one of the things I really like about it. People do tend to have certain preconceptions about it because it's former Soviet country, it's a Muslim majority country, it's next door to Afghanistan, and they assume that it's going to be dangerous. Uzbekistan has an authoritarian government, um, and one of the upsides of that is that they are very, very tight on uh, security and crime. Petty crime is almost unheard of. Um, and things like street harassment, it just doesn't happen. Um, so whereas I, I used to spend a, a lot of time, particularly as a student in my early 20s in India, and every day as a woman was hard work. Um, and I would be incredibly flustered and frustrated and often upset. It just doesn't happen in Uzbekistan. Um, there is a not not only because of the, the the state role but also if somebody were to be to be catcalling or harassing a woman in the street that would bring embarrassment on on their family and their community and people are very honor and and shame conscious mm. um, and guests are to be treated very very well uh, and so i think if if a man was to be behaving inappropriately towards towards women in public um there would be a an immediate um, response from from everybody around you, uh, but I, I certainly find that it's it's very easy. I never have any worries about taking a taxi, about walking out on my own at night, um, and that's actually quite refreshing. Yeah, Thanks, Sophie. Um, Lara has a question on a similar theme, which is how do the locals feel about American travelling? Can I, can I answer this? Uh, yeah. Just, just quickly jumping in, Sophie. Sorry, because I took um, uh, quite a few American tourists to Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan last year, and um, the same as how they feel about everyone. Basically, there is no difference. They they very much like uh, tourists um, and uh, are very hospitable and um, pleased to see us. Basically, and it makes no difference if you're American or British or or anything else for that matter. Um, I had four Americans on my group. We had a, an amazing time. Three came from, two came from Dallas, one came from Canada, and one came from New York. And uh, absolutely no issue at all. No. Which, there's, again, there's a couple so of things I'd, I'd add to that. First of all, there's been a huge increase in the number of Americans visiting Uzbekistan recently. Mm. There are now five direct flights a week from JFK to Tashkent, and they've increased the number of flights because so many more people are traveling. Um, another thing which sort of links into that and somebody asked me last week is what is the uh, reaction towards Jewish visitors and this I'm going to link with the American visitors because um, Uzbekistan is home to one of the oldest Jewish populations in the world the Bukharian Jews have been there for thousands of years and there is a some people wonder if they're one of the lost tribes of Israel um, but in the 
late Soviet period and after independence, a lot of those people emigrated from Uzbekistan and went to Israel or went to the United States. And so there are a lot of uh, Jewish people in the United States who trace their ancestry back to Uzbekistan. And a lot of those families are now coming back to Uzbekistan on family history trips um, or are coming to see uh, the areas of the cities where their families used to live. They want to go to the synagogues. They want to go to the cemetery and so on and so forth. So that's another thing that's driving tourism from the United States to Uzbekistan. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Tom's asked, in terms of logistics, can you use credit cards or US dollars, for example? You can do. Um, it's becoming more common. So in hotels, for example, larger hotels, you can generally use a credit card now. Um, in shops, cash is still preferred and you will need to have local currency. So if you do want to uh, take US dollars, that's fine. You can go and change them in a bank. But what has become much more common is ATM machines that will accept foreign bank cards. So if you've got a MasterCard or a Visa card, um, just take that with you. When you arrive in Tashkent, there are ATMs in the arrivals hall next to the baggage carousel, so you can get cash straight away. Um, and I find these days that's much, much easier than taking foreign currency and then having to look for somewhere to change it. Not like the old days when I had to buy a horse in Bukhara uh, and I had a shopping bag full of cash. I think the biggest note was a 200 song note and 200 songs was about a dollar or so, or less than that, I don't know, 50 cents. And I had this great, literally a wheelbarrow kind of carrying cash, no longer needed. That's that's been one of the big infrastructure improvements in the last few years is how much easier it is to get cash out. Yeah. Right. Um, Charles has asked if there's a dress code for men or women visiting Uzbekistan. Yes and no. Um, so because of the Soviet legacy, actually dress tends to be very, very westernised. Um, certainly in, in a city like Tashkent, people will be dressed in outfits that you wouldn't look out of place in, in Moscow or London. There are some places like the Fergana Valley which are a bit more conservative and you'll see more women in hijab. It's not a it's not a state requirement. Um, and indeed, if anything, the state is quite wary of uh, any kind of um, physical manifestation of, of religious practice. So they are discouraging um, people people to wear wear religious dress. They would much far much rather that you dressed in a secular style. Um, that said, you don't tend to see many people in, in shorts or, or strappy tops. Um, partly it's the climate. Certainly if I went out in shorts and t-shirt, I would burn very quickly in summertime. But also I do feel that even if it's not a, a requirement, it's it's just polite to dress respectfully. I tend to wear um, cotton trousers. I tend to wear maybe a short sleeve t-shirt, but um, yeah, not have, not have my bits hanging out. And if you do go to, to a mosque or to a synagogue or to a church, it's respectful to take your, your shoes off um, and to make sure that your, your shoulders and, and legs are covered. Um, that would be the same. I mean, if you went to the Vatican, for example, if you were going to St. Peter's in Rome, I wouldn't go in in shorts and T-shirt either because I think it's just not very respectful to the people who do consider it to be a sacred place. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Mark, this is probably one for you. Um, Karen's asking, we go to Termiz on our five stands trip, um, which is not advised by the FCDO. Um, do we feel it's worth it and, and, and how safe it, is it? Now this, Sophie and I actually exchanged some emails about this a few weeks ago. Um, Foreign Office actually changed their advice for Termiz a few weeks ago. Then they've done a review and I've noticed that it's crept back. So I actually wrote to the Foreign Office a couple of days ago to clarify with them, have they changed their advice for Teremes back? Or was this just a, an error that got brought in with the overall edit? So first of all, if it's Foreign Office friendly, yes, we will go. And yes, it's worth it. You've got some really interesting Buddhist architecture there. But if they are concerned about it, um, we won't contravene foreign office advice and we have a backup route um, that avoid, avoids Teremes completely and we go to Shakri Subs instead. So, no, um, yes, if it's possible, we'll do it. And I am hoping so. They did amend it, like I said, a few uh, weeks ago, but I think something's gone a little bit weird with their updates. Thank you. Um, and Dominique has asked if there are any particularly botanical gardens in um, Uzbekistan that we would recommend visiting. There are, there are a couple of botanical gardens. There's one particularly in Tashkent. 
um, which is the, the sort of national collection. It's not a national collection on the scale of somewhere like Kew Gardens, but if you are interested in botany, it's, a, it's an interesting place to go. Um, Silk Road botany is very interesting because a lot of the plants that we associate uh, with, with Europe and have in our gardens do actually have Silk Road origins. So plants like tulips, for example, um, also the apple tree, in fact, Almaty, uh, is the, the name Amati in Kazakhstan means father of the apple, because it's thought that the first apples would have, would have evolved in that particular area. So there are some interesting uh, native plants in Central Asia, and Tashkent Botanical Garden would be a good option. If you're going to go to Tajikistan as well, you may want to go to the Horog uh, Botanical Garden in the Pamir. And that has a completely different altitude and microclimate. And so if you're interested in high altitude plants and what will survive at uh, extreme altitude and extreme temperatures and cold temperatures in the winter, that would be an interesting contrast to the botanical garden in Tashkent. Yeah, we offer that on another trip. But I'm not allowed to confuse you with any more because Johnny will just glare at me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Got time for just a couple more questions questions and just to show you that we're never one to swerve difficult questions at Wild Frontiers. Um, John has asked that um, Uzbekistan used to have a questionable human rights record under the previous leader. Um, has that changed at all? So uh, President Karimov was the first president of Uzbekistan after independence and he died in 2016. Um, under his presidency Uzbekistan was a bit of a hermit kingdom. It deliberately cut itself off from the rest of the world and had a fairly horrendous human rights record. That's that's correct, and it's it's very much public record. In fact, um, somebody else, I think one of the questions that I noticed was about Craig Murray's book, and he writes about the the Karimov period. Craig Murray was the British ambassador in Uzbekistan in the early two thousands, um, and obviously saw up close and personal all some very unpleasant things that went on in the country. In twenty sixteen, um, when Karimov died, he was replaced by President Mirziyoyev. And Mizioyev is slightly younger generation, certainly much more uh, Western and outward looking. And he has been a reformist. Um, not everything has been fixed. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't say that's the case, but there have been some significant changes in the country, including some which relate to human rights. So the one which I think is the greatest credit to him is slave labor, uh, which was a problem in the cotton fields. So Uzbek cotton was sanctioned for a very long time because of the use of forced labour, um, including of, of children in the cotton fields. That has been eradicated thanks to work between the Uzbek government and ILO, the uh, UN's International Labour Organization. So they have worked very, very closely together to ensure that forced labour is, is no longer a problem. And Uzbek cotton is now being, being exported. And I expect in the next couple of years, you'll see your, your H&M and Zara have got made in Uzbekistan there. Um, there have been some improvements in uh, attitudes towards religious groups. Uh, there was a lot of religious repression, but I mentioned in my talk, there's been a revival of an interest in Islam, uh, which was prohibited completely under the Soviet period and really continued to be repressed in, in the early years of, of independence as well. So more, more religious openism, uh, openness, uh, more openness towards the media. Um, there's still far to go, but certainly if we compare where Uzbekistan is now compared to where it was 10 years ago, it's barely recognisable as a country. Thank you. Um, yeah, just one more question about travelling in winter. Someone's asked uh, the anonymous, um, would it be snowy and difficult to get around or, or not? It depends where you want to go. So the mountain areas, of course, there will be snow. And one of the things we didn't mention, but perhaps should have done, is you can ski in Uzbekistan. <laughs> so there's a, a brand new ski resort at Zamisoy, which has been built with, by an Andorran management company. Um, and there's several others under construction by French consortium. Uh, so there is, there is skiing in Uzbekistan, and you may want to do that in winter. Um, in terms of traveling not in the mountains in Uzbekistan, you may get snow, you may not. It tends to be a very dry winter. There's very, very little rain. Um, and because there's very little moisture, there's very little snow. So it could be very, very cold and no snow when you visit. Um, however, you might find that you go and it just happens to be in a snowstorm. 
Um, in terms of the major cities, Tashkent, Bukhara, Samarkand, if there's going to be snow, it's probably the end of January, February. Uh, November, December is unlikely to be snow. And if there is, it's only a smattering for a day or two. Um, the outside temperatures can be cold, but then you'll have a bright sunny day, blue skies. Um, and certainly whenever you go indoors, their central heating systems are always fantastic. So you don't have to worry about being cold and dress up warm when you're outside and then, well, go back to your hotel and strip down to your your shorts and T-shirt because it will be very warm indeed. Yeah, almost too warm in, at times. Um, right, sorry, time for one more question, just because it's a lovely question. Um, Tom has asked, what is hard to get in Uzbekistan that would make a good gift for a guy? Ooh. Um, that's <laughs> Um, the the things which which I always take out to friends in Uzbekistan are books, because the publishing sector and the distribution of books in Uzbekistan is quite poor. Um, there aren't many bookshops, but a lot of the guides are have studied English, are interested in English culture, are interested in English literature. So if you've got a favourite novel or a favourite book of poetry, um, or even a book that's been written by a friend or you've read with your book group, something like that would be a really excellent gift. Um, obviously, copies of Harry Potter are always very, very popular, um, but also also classics or uh, a book which is set in your hometown, uh, something like that would always be appreciated. Right. Mike, can I just jump in and quickly answer Liz and Jill, who have both asked questions I see on the chat about, uh, about food. Um, Liz and Jill, I, Food for vegetarians, we often take vegetarians to Uzbekistan, that's no problem. Um, and Jill, I had a lactose intolerant person on my last trip and it wasn't a problem. We managed to sort that out everywhere. There was plenty of uh, plenty of options, great salads, great vegetable dishes, pastas uh, and, and various other things. So don't worry, you will not go hungry. Um, Right, we are have run over by quite a little bit, but never mind, it's been fascinating. And I see we've still got most people still online watching. So that means uh, hopefully you all found it interesting. So thank you so much, Sophie. Once again, thank you so much for your brilliant insight and help in explaining uh, what is this most fascinating country to our, uh, our viewers. Mark, thank you for your uh, knowledge of the region. Mike, thanks for kind of hosting. And um, yeah, thank you all very much for watching. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs>